it was the mid 80s. Um, there was no internet, there was no YouTube, and the only way people transmitted information to each other was uh, by the printed word. Um, I wrote for magazines, I was in university, and I was trying to pay my way through university. And so I, I wrote pieces for magazines, mm -hmm. and I was paid 15 cents a word. Um, eventually, I, I wrote these two books because I thought that there was insufficient literature in Singapore in English. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm claiming that this is literature. <laughs> well, I think it is, actually. And uh, the teenage, you started out with a teenage textbook. Yes, that's right. And then the teenage workbook yes, that's right. followed. Yes. Um, for, so these two books uh, were meant to capture a period in Singapore history, uh, the late 80s, the way we lived in, in the heartland, the, the transport that we took. And the um, as the nation grew up, so did the two characters in the books. And, and they matured in the same way that the country matured. Mm -hmm. And in the books, the idea is this, that um, young people were trying to learn how to become adults. And they referred to this thing called the teenage textbook. This is because in Singapore, Everybody believes that answers are found in textbooks. So that works for school, but I wanted to show that it doesn't work for real life. So every time the characters refer to the teenage textbook to find out how to deal with relationships, how to deal with the parents, mm -hmm. the book would give the worst possible advice. <laughs> and if you followed the advice in textbooks, you would definitely go wrong. So it was a subversive book. I'm surprised they haven't arrested me yet. <laughs> and you, it sounds like um, you were in your teenage years yourself when you wrote it, or perhaps just after your teenage years. Just, my teenage years are, are, are far behind me, so I, I can't answer that question. But at the time that you wrote them, it uh, must have been semi-autobiographical, perhaps. Yes, I, it was still fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. So yes, and, and I wrote this when I was studying uh, in university. Um, and at that time, I had to deal with this idea of copyright because after it came out, um, my, um, other people were interested to do the same thing. And I was thinking, oh, this is, this is an area which I ought to uh, be interested in because um, as a content creator, as a writer, I'd like to know to what extent people can copy and use my work. Later on, the books became a film. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a TV series and a stage uh, musical and stuff like that. They mm -hmm. became adaptations, to use the technical term. Yes. And I had to, I, I, I was interested in my rights, and then I became interested in the rights of all creators. Because in Singapore, I think in most societies, the content creator is at the bottom of the food chain. The struggling artist, the writer, he sits by himself or she sits by herself and works for years to produce something of value to society. And then, in order for it to be exploited in the old days, a publishing company, a movie company, would have to uh, take it up and they would have to negotiate. And that would be this power imbalance. Mm -hmm. and, um, and until today, uh, content creators haven't been, been able to solve that problem. Uh, creating content is a lonely process, but negotiations shouldn't be that way either. So that's why the law offers protection, but that's not, that's not the issue. The issue is that artists, writers, photographers, performers, they don't dare to use their legal rights. And is that where you came from at the time as well? Where you, yes. you wrote it because you enjoyed it. Yes. You, you thought that there was a need. IP protection was probably furthest from your mind. Exactly. The, the, the fact that I could be published that gave me immense, immense pride. And I, I figure for most artists, at some point in their career, when they just want to break through, all that they think about is, someone's gonna publish my book, someone's interested in my artwork, I'm gonna to get to perform on stage, to sing, to dance. I'm gonna be famous. I'm gonna be famous, I'll sign anything. Everybody went through this, the Beatles, Elvis Presley, so we're in good company, right. in a way. <laughs> and we're still around, unlike yes. most of them. Uh, but still, the, uh, the fact is that because you then got to the stage where by 1998, the movie yes. then came out. So within yes. 10 years of the publication of the book, you had to make some very serious decisions. Yes. Did you also make any serious mistakes in the process? Well, um, fortunately in Singapore, and, and this is very interesting when we talk about law and business. In Singapore, um, at that time, there was still an honor system in that 
uh, production companies who wanted to adapt films or adapt uh, um, movies and books, they would still um, want to adapt, uh, abide by some industry standards. And industry standards were equitable. So I, I didn't really have to negotiate very hard for anything. Um, but I'm, I'm not really? sure. So today. they just came along and said, "Here, please sign this multi-million-dollar contract to produce the movie." Right. I. I. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's exactly what happened. Multi-million dollars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. The the truth is that uh, I think there were pretty standard contracts available, and and we just signed that. Mm -hmm. I worry about the situation today because today, thanks to the internet, uh, content creators are not dealing with people who are living in the same city or even in the same country. They're dealing with strangers who could be thousands of miles away, whom they've never met, they will never meet, and they will have to trust them. So these, these um, unknown organizations, for example, and I'm not casting aspersions on them, but they are strangers, um, and they will come from a perspective of, we are going to do a deal. This is, this is a business arrangement. I'm not interested in forming a relationship and if, if things go pear-shaped, I'm out of here. In which case, it's important for content creators to arm themselves, at least with the legal knowledge. Given the fact that things were relatively easy for you by, by what you're saying, yes. um, does, does, does that mean that you didn't learn some of the lessons that you perhaps learned a little bit harder later in life when that honor system wasn't perhaps quite so rigid? Well, um, well from, uh, from my first day in law school, um, and for many years after, all my lecturers will say, I haven't learned very much. And this, is, this happened in the same way too. I, I think um, the, the hard lessons only come from observing other people when and they make mistakes. So I, was, I was quite fortunate. Um, in Singapore at that time, uh, the TV industry was still very young movie industry is very young. And so there weren't many um, opportunities to go wrong. Okay, yes. fast forward, yes. uh, you then went through law school. Mm -hmm. Were there any things that you thought later on, goodness, in hindsight, oh, that was so risky. Uh, would you do things differently now with uh, your knowledge in law? Um, I, I would, I'm thankful that I did not have to. Uh, for, for people writing today, they would probably uh, need to arm themselves legally before they started negotiating with, uh, with a publisher and, and so on. Today, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is with the advent of the internet and social media, everything became complicated very fast. And the, um, the situation in the 90s was slow and simple. We still had stamps on uh, snail mail letters yes. and, and, and things like that. I remember stamps. As a litigator, did, yes. were, were there times then when you thought during the ensuing legal career that you had, where you thought, you know, where you were able to draw on your experience of being on the other side of the fence, of being that creator? Yes, and what I learned was that the, mm -hmm. uh, the business side of exploiting content, the business side is the side that uses lawyers. So the publishing houses, the production companies, the music studios, um, they are the ones who have the ability to access legal help, legal services. And uh, once again, they are at the top of the food chain, whereas uh, people at the bottom are uh, at the bottom of the food chain. Um, they need pro bono help. Uh, they need advice, but they don't know how to get it. So I think in Singapore, for example, there are avenues for uh, for artists, for people in the artistic community to get pro bono help. And uh, they can also refer to resources online from the Law Society to uh, see what rights they have and to learn how to protect themselves. Because ultimately, artists have difficulty seeing themselves as business people. They have difficulty understanding that they need to have income, they need to have insurance, they need to uh, protect themselves using contracts, um, there may be um, employment issues. Um, uh, they need to think about their own medical benefits and so on. Uh, I've met many artists who see themselves primarily <coughs> as uh, the other end of the spectrum. In other words, um, they must access their emotional side and, and in order to do that, they must distance themselves 
away from their logical side. So it, it's left brain and right brain. So when we start talking to artists about contracts and numbers and legal rights, they feel very conflicted. They feel, uh, in a sense, upset because we are, uh, we are taking them out of one identity into another. So that's the main difficulty, the mindset. It, the, ideal, the, ideal, um, the ideal content creator would be someone with the creativity of Vincent van Gogh, mm -hmm. um, but the business sense of Bill Gates. So basically, um, Vincent van Gates. Right. If, if we had that, that would be great. But, but you don't have them. We don't have presumably. them. Yes. Human beings are either one or the other. And artists are successful precisely because they're extremely left brain and able to tap into their, that emotional creativity. But yes. are you a Vincent van Gates? Because after all, you wrote these books and, right. and you then did actually turn to law where you then became that. It's, um, it's very kind of you, but um, these are not works of art. They have never been accused of being works he, of art. He's lying, I'm sure of it, because the so, proof is right here. He sold 10,000 copies, it's right. also in the corner. But so are you able to make that switch between the creative side and the business side? I, I, I can see the problem. Um, I, I can't pretend to be as artistic as all that, to be honest. But you would have seen your colleagues, right? Yes. And others in the legal fraternity also struggle with the same perhaps that, that gap in, uh, because they're all on the business side, your, your legal yes. uh, counsel, uh, friends, yes. associates. What do you tell them based on the experience that you've had being on the creative side as to how to empathize with, with them? Right, well, the, the thing is, intellectually, most lawyers understand that their clients are different animals. In fact, lawyers think that we're a different species from our clients completely. But we think that we know what to do, it's just that it's very difficult to do it. Um, a lot of times, artists, um, and I'm trying not to make too many generalizations, but um, artists, the first thing we have to understand is their worldview, their perspective about what's important. They, if they're copied, they, they don't take it in a business sense of, I'm losing revenue. They take it in a personal sense of, I'm offended. I'm offended that the work that I created is no longer attributed to me. And I take that personally. And we have to say, hold on to that, but express it in a different way. Express it in a way by claiming for money, claiming for royalties. Uh, that's quite a leap for many artists. Because they have so much ego, I suppose, tied up in that. I, I don't no, mean that in a negative sense. Purely no. that uh, it's their baby who's that's been kidnapped. So no, it's, it's the perfect word. Perfect word. It is. Um, it is ego, um, in in a good way. And you must. Uh, you, we have to identify with with how important that is. I believe that each time an artist creates, he he separates a little bit of his ego. Takes it, away from, takes it away from a secret place and puts it out in public to show people and say, this is what I feel. Do you feel the same way? And I think that's a moment that's very difficult for any artist. And then when that becomes successful, as it occasionally is, then he thinks, well, I'm famous. I should be able to derive some benefit from this. But if other people start copying it, that's when he feels, oh, um, I've given a bit of myself up for nothing. How helpful is it to actually have this understanding before you go into it? In other words, not wait for something to go wrong, for your idea to be copied, for your artwork to be copied or whatever. Yes. But to, well, forewarned is forearmed, isn't it? Um, I, I like that and that's a, a, absolutely true. And I, I think for every serious artist, he <laughs> needs a spouse. I mean a business spouse. Mm -hmm. I mean a partner who is committed to the artist's welfare from a business perspective, from a commercial exploitation perspective. And uh, if whether you're the Beatles or Elvis Presley, you will need a business manager. One, one had a good one, one had a terrible one. Mm -hmm. um, all of us, you could be Cristiano Ronaldo, 
who is who is an artist in a way, mm-hmm. and you still need your business manager to protect you. That we, chap Joseph, who just landed his job at Manchester United. Right, right, yes, and and uh, there's a lot to say about that, but uh, I must uh, resist the temptation. <laughs> the 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 idea is we if we look at sportsmen, we think oh obviously these people need commercial managers obviously, and and that's a bit of an elitist viewpoint, but we think. Oh, sportsmen, they're focused on sports, mm-hmm. so they need someone else to help them with the intellectual side of things. And if we look at a writer, sometimes we, we, we can't see that dichotomy. All we see is, oh, this is a writer, he's very intellectual, he must be very clever with money. Let's say he's a writer about money, or let's say he's someone like Malcolm Gladwell, or uh, a, a, a writer that we admire for intellect. That person may be very good at writing books, but it doesn't mean that he's good at negotiating his own business. Yes. Well, Hollywood is littered with uh, yes. actors who've uh, gone bankrupt, who've squandered their, their billions because they're good at acting, just not good with the money. That's that's right. That's right. And um, I think that's true for all of us. Um, but it's just that most of us are not at the extreme end of one spectrum. Um, and that enables us to access the right brain side of it. The, the, the side that says, hey, wait a minute, okay, let's think about the money side. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I think if we're wise enough to surround ourselves with at least well-meaning uh, business acquaintances who will look out for us, um, that, that will be a start. Yes, and then we can get on with our creativity. Yes. In the last uh, 10 minutes or so that we have then, let's talk a little bit about your track record as a litigator oh. and the success stories that you've had. What is the common thread, I suppose, when you've acted on behalf of an artist, a singer, an actor, an author like you? Um, what, what Was there something common where you said, yes, um, generally speaking, I was successful when they did certain things or uh, had certain attributes. Right. I, I guess the, the artist that I have in mind is not an artist in the sense that we would commonly associate with it. So this was a man um, who had very little education. And one, day, and one day he had an idea, which is to sell secondhand goods. Um, he made a bit of money on that. And he decided, why don't I do this? I create my own consumer products and I put my own brand on it. And the people who are buying my secondhand goods are people from Africa. And I want to go to Africa and sell and set up a new brand of consumer products. And it, it and he didn't speak English. He, did, he, he spoke only Chinese. And so imagine a, a Chinese speaking Singaporean going into Africa and going up to each village and saying, I have a new brand of consumer products. These are microwave ovens, these are televisions and um, marketing to them. He was immensely successful. He built up a brand, and with any successful brand, uh, he, he was copied. Of course. So he was creative in the sense that he was creative in a business, uh, to look at business and art. But when he was copied, he reacted the same way as any artist, which is, I'm offended. Mm. I, I'm losing money, and that's something we have to account for but I feel personally aggrieved. So um, um, eventually, he, he succeeded in a claim for passing off. Um, and that's a story in itself. It's very unfortunate he's passed away. Um, but the, the upshot is this. His reaction is a reaction that's a very human type of, uh, a human type of level. Mm-hmm. So we have to recognize in each of our clients the artist in them the creative spirit that resides in every entrepreneur. Because every entrepreneur, to an extent, has to access that moment of, I know something, I've seen something, Uh, it's new. And he has to look at that, and he has to exploit that. So once we understand that, we will understand why they feel so offended when they are copied. And it's only then that we can begin to talk to them about how they can get legal redress. Mm -hmm. But isn't that exactly that leap that often, and and you mentioned this earlier, you know, people are very um, in an unequal bargaining position because after all, they want to get on with creating art. Yes, yes, I'm aggrieved, I'm offended, and I I feel I'm losing money because other people are passing off, as you say. Yes. Oh, but it's just too much trouble to chase it down. And what if I lose? And, And... is it really worth it? And I mean, how do you get over that? Right. So in that sense, 
um, an entrepreneur, a founder of a startup, and a starving writer and artist, they're no different. They're all the same person. They're a person who's at the bottom of the food chain with a bright idea. And they're prepared to sacrifice a lot of their legal rights in order to get that idea exposed to the public. So we, it, once we start seeing entrepreneurs in that light as artists who put their commercial interests back and who put forward other, um, their, their aim of being widely known, then we can start to tell them, look, it's all very well that you want your idea to be on the platform of everyone, but you must also think of the future when you want to start exploiting your idea and controlling your idea and, and recovering some of your investments. We have, to, we have to talk to clients, especially entrepreneurs, as if they were artists. In a sense, they are, right? I mean, an entrepreneur yes. is all about creating, well, a business, I suppose, creating a product, a service. Yes. Service innovations is all about creativity, isn't it? That's right. W when you started your business, you had an idea and you were creative. And I wager that at some point you thought, I must make compromises. I want my business to get the highest yeah. possible exposure. And then I shouldn't be so legalistic. I shouldn't insist on all my legal rights. I have to show good faith just so that I can get the necessary exposure. Mm -hmm. We all make that compromise. Well, and how many times do people say to you, oh, you should do this for me for free. It'll be good for your exposure. Yes, that, right? that strikes a chord. That strikes a chord. Well, what nonsense that is, to but be frank. When, when I'm a young, <laughs> as, a, as a young lawyer, it, it's very tempting. It's very tempting to say, well, I get my first case. Um, I get a chance to argue it. I could, I could do it for less. Mm -hmm. I could give you a discount. So um, in a sense, we're all exploited at that point, and, and then we have to recognize it. Given, again, what you've learned now and, and the fact that establishing those relationships before they really kick off, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of trying to find yourself that trusted person, yes. what should you look for in a lawyer? Uh, because it's not just, as you say, the lawyer seeing the entrepreneur as a, as a creative. What about in the opposite direction? What sort of mindset should you bring? Well, um, choosing, choosing a lawyer is, is a lot like choosing a spouse. And if you start from a, a perspective of there is only one soulmate and, and when I meet that soulmate, everything will be perfect, it will be magic, happily ever after, then you'll fail. Same goes with choosing a lawyer. Is this just another human being um, who has a specialist skill? Uh, don't. Don't look for a soulmate. Look instead for someone who has some level of competence and honesty and whom you can communicate with. So there is no one size fits all for lawyers. And I, I don't like the way that we rank lawyers and we say this person is good for this and that person's good. This person is good in one situation with one type of client and he may be terrible in other situations. So you have to go out and, and check the chemistry. It's, uh, it's important to start with people um, that you are recommended to. So if, if there's some word of mouth, if you ask around and people say, oh, try this person, that, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Finally then, let's talk briefly about technology. Right. Because often technology is seen as the silver bullet to solve all of your problems. At the end of the day, though, it's still a one-to-one -one relationship, let's say in the pitch mark case where you're pitching a product or a yes. service or a, a graphic design and an architectural drawing, whatever it is. It's still a human relationship. Yes. First, do you see technology as helping, hindering, or being that panacea? Well, um, technology is the panacea for us if we were robots. The bad news is that we're not robots. Right. We're human beings, we're driven by emotions most of the time, despite what lawyers tell you. We're driven by un inexplicable desires and reactions. And one day, they will invent a robot that will understand human beings. But it's not going to happen in our lifetime. So right now, the best people to understand human beings are other human beings, of which, fortunately, there are billions around. So I think technology right now is at a point where it's pretending to be a little bit like 
human beings in some way. Uh, for example, to recommend things for us to watch on, on Netflix. If you like this, you should watch this or to buy stuff uh, mm -hmm. online. If you bought this, uh, people who bought this also like to buy that. And that's about it. Um, technology won't, won't create anything um, without human beings because the human being has to exist to respond to it. Yes. Well, and you know, lawyers usually say to you, uh, okay, we can litigate for you, but to be frank, as soon as you're into litigation phase, as soon as you are suing your client for ripping off your idea that you pitched at, yes. a, at a media pitch, for example, yes. it's already too late, isn't it? Um, yes, that's, that's true. That's true. And the, the funny thing is, um, many people don't believe that, and the reason is, is Hollywood. Uh, people watch uh, too much fantasy legal dramas on Hollywood. And so they imagine that they can solve all their legal problems in 45 minutes. Um, just in the same way as you can watch medical dramas where you can diagnose someone, go for surgery, and the person recovers in mm -hmm. 45 minutes. Yes. It's fun, but it's not reality. So it, in reality, yes, litigation drags out and disputes are very hard to resolve. But um, I, technology helps a little bit on that score. It might speed things up, or if there's a pandemic, it might allow us to carry on in some fashion so that we can resolve our disputes. But they will not replace human beings. For example, there's a lot of talk about, can a robot be your lawyer? Uh, can it research cases for you and argue cases for you and always win? I, I don't think so, but I'd like to ask it in a different way. How would you feel if your judge was a robot? Ooh, mm, that's I'm tough. Not that sure. How would you feel if your prime minister or president was a robot and he made all, it made all the decisions for the country? We wouldn't feel that comfortable. So if we're not comfortable with that level of discretion, if we're not comfortable to rely on AI for that, why should we be comfortable to rely on AI uh, to make legal arguments for us? Um, ultimately, the lawyer, when he stands up, is your representative. That's why he says, I represent so-and-so. Only a human being can represent another human being. If you think that you can be represented by a machine, I think there's an issue. Yes. Mm. Well, uh, it's been a fascinating chat. Unfortunately, Likewise. it hasn't exactly been 45 minutes just yet, and we could possibly go on for, for many hours. But in the meantime, thank you very much for joining us here on the Pitchmark thank program. Thank you for inviting me. At AIPPI, and uh, all the best for your next book. What will it be, actually? In all good bookshops. Yes. Right. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, yet to come. Thank you very yes. much indeed. Adrian Tan, partner at TSMP Law Corporation here in Singapore and author of the Teenage Textbook and the Teenage Workbook.